We are now recording. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight is the regular board meeting, February 25th. Yep. As usual, Zoom catches you off guard. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is February 25th, 2021. This is the regular Board of Education meeting for the Horsehead Central School District Board of Education. We are coming to you virtually as uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, at this time, I would like to turn it over to the board president, Ms. Christine Dale. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, we have reconvened from our executive session. Uh, so um, let's get started with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag. flag of the United States, United States of America, America and to the Republic and the Republic and which is the nation, nation for God and for God, God, God be and in justice, justice for all. Justice as well. Probably justice for all. Okay, so um, just just real quick, I just want to kind of go through um, the order of our agenda a little bit. We've changed it up a little bit for this meeting. Uh, typically, after we approve minutes, we would go into um, opening up for public comment. And because this is the board meeting where Dr. Douglas would do the state of the schools, we felt it was important to do the state of the schools presentation first. Um, to then, you know, potentially could answer any questions that people might have, um, but it really kind of gives a great basis for where we are today and where we're going. Um, so we were going to do, we're moving that up into the agenda, and then we'll go to the student representative while the um, public gets in place to be able to come online to be able to ask their questions or state their concerns. So a little bit of a different format than what we're used to. Um, the board is spread throughout the school, so we're all here on site just in different rooms and different offices um, coming through you through through zoom to all of you so first up tonight we have approval of our minutes so we have uh, 2.01 and 2.02 .02. can I have a motion please so moved second okay all those in favor say uh, or any any questions or discussion I'm sorry No. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed nay. Any abstentions? Okay. All right. So next we have our superintendent report. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Douglas for this, his state of the schools presentation. Thank you, Ms. Dale. Give me just one second. Uh, Want to share my screen, Mr. Giancoli, if you could please pin my video so it's the full size video. I need to just move this down. Please bear with me as I just try to get everything situated so I can see the screen. Okay. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight is the state of the schools that we try to do annually. We usually do it at the beginning of the budgetary process, but because the budgetary process in the state of Albany uh, is still looming and we do not have a lot of details, so uh, it is still a little speculative. Tonight's presentation is about where we have been, where we are, and where we are going. Oop, gotta go back. Where we have been. Nearly one year since the pandemic began, the state put our schools and communities on pause. More specifically, the governor under executive authority granted to him by the legislature put us on full pause uh, during March 16th and remaining through the end of the year. Basically, you saw classrooms, cafeterias emptied out, hallways shuttered and dark, and honestly, our physical action activity spaces and our community was not able to avail themselves. And we basically had a very empty um, school. Finally, after three months of waiting, we were given uh, some direction by the state education department, as well as concurrently by the Department of Health, as well as our governor. And we were one of the only districts that we know of that fully did the plan by engaging our stakeholder and community groups 
over two weeks in the summer to develop the most reasonable plan that could be effectively put together, which is currently what we are going through. This was sort of some of the people's first time being six feet apart, being masked, or if they're socially distanced, they could be unmasked and we had to leave it to individual's choice. Luckily, our area was under um, a positivity rate that was very non-existent at that time. Once we had our plan presented, it was time for the September opening. Sort of a dreary day when you welcome back the school with the fog, but we were all excited under the new, what could be the concept of normal. Basically our enrollment started, we saw a drop in enrollment because of enrollment either in private school where you could uh, essentially uh, go five days a week because they had the space and they could get the staffing to do it because they already had low enrollment. Unfortunately for larger school districts across the area, we were bound by the requirements as we knew them to enforce social distancing, cohorting, and trying to de-densify our schools while maintaining the best educational program for all with a mandatory remote component, in-person component, and some form of hybrid. Our percentage uh, as we started the year was, as you can see, for the whole district around 7% for homeschool. That was up from usually about three to 4%. When we had the leftover students from not going to homeschool that wanted in person, we had to split those cohorts in half. And because of our teaching staff and the sports that we needed, we also had to address the 100% remote. Between each of those um, provided us the sectioning and the requirements to fit anywhere from eight, nine, 10 to 11 at the elementaries, maybe up to 12 uh, in each cohort in the middle levels and high school levels, no more than 12 or 13. Some of our rooms could fit this, some of our rooms could not. So we had to recapitulate uh, the whole district and try to do what's best to de-densify according to the regulations. And as reported recently by the CDC, we've been doing this since September and now they just willfully came out with their guidance that recommends everything that we were doing back then. But they also stated that it was uh, from the new administration for potentially one day a week. I think since then they've realized the error in the way and our goal is to get back to five days a week as soon as possible. Unfortunately, right now, the hardest part is we just do not have the space to appropriately de-densify and socially distance. If that changes, which we are hoping that it may uh, in the near future from the governor, that would be a game changer and allow us time to start uh, giving the students more time in the classroom on a weekly basis. So we started the school, our principals and students out there with the new normal face masks, welcoming gloves, and so forth. And, and really, it was a new error. Uh, it was trial and error, a way that, you know, education has never done before. And it really grows against the grain of that connectivity and personalness. We had the new norms of having to have temperature screenings, making sure that we are disinfecting regularly throughout the day. The deep cleaning was the word, but it was really a misnomer because you don't need one day to deep clean and disinfect, you need to disinfect regularly every day. And I gotta say hands off to our maintenance and facilities department, our teachers, faculty and staff, because they are regularly doing it to help keep surfaces clean and clear and as much as possible germ-free. Even with our new ceramic coating, which raises the pH balance and has a shelf life of over four or five months, we regularly do it throughout the year to try to keep that infection rate low. In addition, you can see the socially distance. Even this is one of the bigger classrooms, but it still can only handle no more than really 12 deaths. Now, if you go to three feet, you can get about 24 and that would be a whole class, but we would need regulations on that as that's one of the current movements out there. In addition, a key emphasis is proper hygiene. Wash your hands, wash your hands, sing twinkle, twinkle, little star, but wash your hands and keep washing your hands. And I have to say from our pre-K all the way up to our staff, they've been doing a wonderful job. And when we started, we were so worried that they would not be able to handle the mass. When I'm going around, I see the little kids coming in and they don't really have a problem with the mask. They do every now and then need to adjust it. Sometimes it goes below the nose, 
Uh, sometimes it's on the chin, but for the most part, if you talk to them and everything, or they even self-correct and, and help their uh, colleagues out at whichever grade level, it is a sight to see because at one time we thought they would not be able to handle it. So kudos to all of them and the hard work of the staff to ensure that that's happening. We got off to a start. Infection rates rose because of a major cluster in the area and that cluster really hit Horseheads hard because it was centered in Horseheads. Uh, it had its wings, then we had a couple other clusters, one being at the prison, one being at BOCES, one being in, in uh, some daycares. And what happened is that took down our staffing. Even though the infection rate was high, we ran out of staff and we had to close. And we said, okay, we're gonna close for two weeks, which was the recommendation. We did that, we were getting ready to open. And then on, I think it's October 21st, Governor Cuomo with his executive authority and full uh, force of being able to say exactly what everybody does in New York State enacted his uh, colored zone microclusters and he placed Shimon County without reviewing it later into an orange and yellow zone, which virtually the orange zone shut down every school in the county except for Big Flats, which posed its own unique challenges. So on October 26, Big Flats has been open ever since and all the other district, district buildings were required to go to remote. That was tried and true and, and really uh, a harrowing account because everybody had to shift what they knew to a new dynamic. Our teachers did it, our parents had to adjust and we thank everybody for doing that. Once we got through the area, we were told that with some testing of a new format of testing, which here's an example of it, um, we could start to reopen. And that happened right around the end of November into December and we had to get the supplies. And then of course, we had to ensure that disinfecting over again. So testing disinfectant allowed us to stage a phased reopening during the hardest time, which is a holiday surge around December 14th. Teachers were having to shift again from having kids in class at the elementary is only having kids in class or only having kids remote, but then having to shift now that we had to take care of all remote for everybody, but big flats had to take care of remote and in person at the same time, changing the dynamics of what the stakeholder group had in place one more time, which is stressful to say the least on all parts, mom, dad, grandma, grandma, uh, the student, the teacher and our staff. But, we have come through it, it's not easy. Nobody said this year was going to be easy, but we commend everybody. You are making a difference for the kids and we are moving the best we can forward and we thank everybody for that. In addition, you started seeing that uh, at the beginning of January, we started bringing back our secondary level and we we're doing hybrid and Zooming at the same time. That has its own unique challenges as we just mentioned. Also, we started looking at, you know, different clubs, different opportunities, different things that can go forward. And then what happened, and for some reason, it's not getting me everything, but that's a good one. That's, that's a picture of Miss Dufort with an English class and, and how they do a presentation like we're doing tonight. In addition, all during this time, we started Horses 2030, whether it was at the high school, whether it was at the middle school, we are in full throttle with construction. Now, that was planned over three years ago, but it was meant to take about four to five years, and we are coming up on year uh, roughly three, three and a half, and we are progressing. But that's where we were, we did the phased reopening to hybrid instruction date December and January, and now where we are, it is a far different place than where we were March 2020, even September 2020, as we adapt to rapidly changing situations. And I have a feeling with the latest controversy at our state level with our governor, the changing has been more rapidly of late just because it is good news for everybody to start to reopen. I know that is one of the cases you've seen athletics reopening and we need to ask for music and physical education if athletics are open and in close contact even with high risk sports that our musics and our physical education should be able to uh, bring down their distances. But at this point, we're still under the governor's direction and requirements. 
So we had a second semester shift. And what was interesting about this is people want more in-person instruction. So we had a large number of people that were remote in the first semester opt to come back. And what was different is, is that at the secondary levels, we had more people that were in person choose to go remote. Now, some people will say, well, that means you can put more kids in the class. The problem is, is our class sizes, as we've mentioned, we had 500 kids, we went down to 400. If you move that throughout the classes and try to double up, we're still over the requirements for our classes. So we can't just bring kids back even just four days a week. Uh, at this point, because we do not meet the guidelines as well as the social distancing aspect, and we do not have the staffing to even split those classes. That is the case for most districts in New York State. Uh, most large districts ex exceptionally uh, have gone to a two day a week hybrid. Uh, some smaller districts have gone to a half day, five days a week or a full day. There is one district in this area that has just gone to five days a week, but what they did is they cut out all of their specials programs and used those teachers to teach the core academics. So it's five days a week. I don't know what the school would be like if you did not have your musics, your arts, your libraries and so forth, but that's the choice that those districts made. Our stakeholders chose to try to keep the whole child's interest best at heart. As we've gone through this, you can see the kids are back fully as of uh, January 7th. Uh, we've got classes where kids are in there, they're wearing their masks, they're doing the right thing, they're working uh, with classmates that are home as well as at work. And the district took on a heavy toll of making sure that we had one-to-one -one technology for our students that needed it. We wanna thank the parents because many of them went out and got the technology that they needed as well as learning a new program called It's Learning to help manage so that we are far better off than where we were in March without that. As such, the, the, the governor has ordered that all schools must be prepared to go forward with uh, remote learning at any time in the future and must have a mandated plan to carry forth from year to year, just in case. So we have more uh, pictures here with science and you can even see the smiles when they're distanced, they get their mass breaks uh, and they go through for their food and their lunch lines. And that's even challenging because at the elementaries, they have the cafeteria. At the high school, we just opened a cafeteria. At the middle school, we just closed the cafeteria. So there's a lot of great positive things going on, but there is definitely a massive amount of challenges that we always have to look and adjust and overcome. What's really amazing is the creativity. Our class officers are meeting via Zoom. Our green room players are doing a virtual play. Our band is trying to do the best that they can with the 12 foot rule. And they took it the hardest because unfortunately New York State Field Bands Association had to make a canceling of their season at that time. And it's hard to reschedule that where NISPA, the sports programs did. Who would ever think wrestlers could wrestle with a mat mask on? Uh, phys ed playing badminton with a mask on. Uh, kids regularly socializing and adjusting and learning that there are other ways to communicate and other ways to actively engage during the year. So where are we at is the COVID dashboard. We monitor the data regularly. We had seven new cases as of today. Uh, we are down to about 1.5 1.7% 1. positivity rate, but that is just a warning. It can go up at any time and it can go down at any time. We have to be vigilant and, and really tried and true in keeping sure that we maintain the requirements as mentioned by the CDC, the six foot social distancing, although it might be changed, we just don't know, we're waiting to see, uh, as well as the hygiene, the hand washing, the contract tracing, the disinfecting, and the de-densification, which is the number one thing they say helps avoid COVID spread, especially with variants. The biggest thing is that there's vaccine implementation, and right now uh, it is not available for students, but it is available for uh, adults and in New York State, 1B helps us get our 65 and above populations, now our comorbid populations, but it also has taken essential workers, which is always the education uh, staff here, and allowed them to get that vaccination. In the six to seven weeks, we have had over 400 
and I believe 30 individuals received the vaccination out of about 730. We were about 60% and we have about 33% that we just do not know uh, any information. So we are in the process of gathering that just like the governor issued an executive order to do such a thing just a couple days ago. So the more we find out information, I think the more the vaccinations uh, tick up, especially in this population, that is going to provide uh, some reassurance as we move forward. There's no bets, there's no guarantees, but that is something that is a major positive, as well as there's more to come in the very near future. So hopefully this will be part of uh, those lights at the end of the tunnel. Just so that you know the data, this is our cases for uh, positive student cases, positive staff cases and direct contacts over the course of the year in each of our departments. And this is the total cases. A large portion of those cases honestly took place in early September, the October, some as recently as in January. But as you look at the daily cases by week, for this past week, you can see we had four positive cases, no positive staff cases, and we had direct contacts. What's really nice, and you can't say nice about this, but it, what's really nice is our parents at home and our students and our staff, when they become sick or they're starting to have symptoms, they have been doing what they're supposed to and not coming in. We've had two of the students in our, in our uh, voluntary testing program be identified first thing in the morning on a Monday, which is great because what happens is they don't end up taking down a, a classroom or other students, even though they may have been asymptomatic. So we are trying to monitor this regularly and we regularly post this for the community to see so that you can see when we are starting to have staffing issues. In addition, our construction project has finished a couple major milestones at the beginning of the year and throughout this semester. We've been opening up some high school science and math classrooms with the new look. And the, as you can see, still socially distanced. Although what happens in the science rooms, you just put two seats at each of the tables. That's where some of the problem can be. You can't barricade those uh, tables uh, as, as well as individual desks. So we have to be cognizant of that. But this is long overdue because as you can see in the upper right-hand corner of the side, of that classroom is almost double to two and a half times bigger than what that classroom size would have been in our former um, situation. That's really ind indicative of what every classroom, whether it's pre-K all the way up to the high school, needs is appropriate resizing for today's education versus 1950s, 1960s. In addition, our high school library is, is starting to ramp up and get fully uh, occupied as well. Uh, this is a great ad addition for our students, but it's also going to be eventually a great addition for our community because we have two active classrooms that can be also used once we are able to open up to outside groups uh, as this is going to be not a meeting area, but an actively gauged uh, community of the library throughout the day and also outside of the day as we move forward. This is wonderful for what our students are seeing because it provides so much differentiated uh, opportunities between private rooms, classrooms, computer rooms that the students can use without having a class and can go in and out. In addition, our cafeteria from 1950s really needed an update. Uh, we had, it was very dark. We had no interior light. Now what happens is you can see this is more of a, a, a one-stop uh, situation where students come in and they have a galley to go into and they can scatter throughout to get served and also go through uh, with their lunches. They have private booths. So we also have tables. Right now, we do not have the tables in because we still have to socially distance. That's why you see the desks in there. But this is a major upgrade from where uh, the district was, and that's what we we're looking to do. And we we're so proud that the community supported Horseheads 2030 with over an 82% approval rating because we will be having to start considering the next phase of Horseheads 2030 soon. Our middle school is not being left out. We did the technology rooms over the summer. We did uh, the art rooms as well. And currently they are undergoing and doing the uh, cafeteria as that is up for a remodel. So that they also have an appropriate stage and appropriate venue that they can fit a large gathering in there once we are allowed to have those gatherings. So a lot of going on and this summer we'll have more and that back parking lot will finally be fixed and be permanently turned into a bus loop. Where are we going? This is the biggest thing. 
Tonight, I'm asking the board uh, to get their permission to formally request and make the request that other superintendents are starting to make to grant a three foot distancing with 100% masking for in person learning to start returning to our schools. We are also going to ask that it, during my advocacy that we would seek immediate guidance from the state on when districts can bring students back to the classroom five days per week with whatever restrictions are in place but we need to know that guidance and update from the beginning of the year as so much has changed and little has changed from the governor's executive orders and the Department of Health's guidance. And also, just so that you know, we're exploring additional instructional contact opportunities at the elementary and secondary level as we've talked, but we also have to make sure we do not put a variety of stress on the instructional staff as well as the parental uh, component because any change that we've experienced over the two or three iterations that we've had between September and now has caused additional changes in family structure, anxiety, mental health and wellness issues. And we're trying to balance everybody's need, not anyone's individual needs. Also, where are we going? One of the hardest parts since March is we have food insufficiency in the area and we are continuing to meet the food needs of our students as well as others that really are in dire need uh, through our food service and transportation departments. They have been absolutely godsends to the individuals of Horseheads. And if we know somebody that needs some help, we have been trying to help our community. We are also advocating that the state reviews and modifies the 12 foot distancing requirements for music and physical education. If you can let the athletes play, you can let the musicians and physical education students play and sing. There is no reason that one can be over the other as long as we follow strict guidance of keeping kids and students and staff safe. We wanna also try to make sure that we're moving to support remote learners throughout the remainder of the school year, even if something changes, because we do feel that even if there was a change at the governor's level, which we're being hinted at, should be potentially coming in the near, very near future, what would happen is, is I doubt they would change that people would still have the option to do remote because vaccinations are not truly out there yet. So I think remote learning is with us at least through the end of this year for those that require it and would like it. Uh, and we will do everything we can to make it so that everybody hopefully can have the education of their choice as soon as they re change the guidance. And then also, just so that you know, you know, our senior activities, the good part about this senior class, even though it's a difficult senior year, is we are seeing potential for senior activities starting to kick off for the class of 2021. We have athletics back. We have some of our extracurriculars. We've got green room players. We are doing recognitions for our athletes. We are going to do recognitions for our uh, field band and our band, at, band and green room players no different than we would do any year. And if somebody isn't doing something, if we're forgetting something, please get to the building principal. We will ensure I have every confidence in the world, our high school principal, our middle school principal, as well as our elementary principals will take care of the situation. If you have any issues that feel that are not being followed up, please feel free to give my office a call. Unfortunately, social media can be the place where everybody reaches out to that doesn't necessarily drive the change. Discussions, positivity, working together and actively having those encounters and engagements and discussions is what's going to help get everything. We try as a district, my administration, my staff, try to deliver the expectations as best we can under the current pandemic situation. And we will always continue. We have made no cuts and we are trying not to make cuts. Uh, as we go through and we are going to need your help to put pressure on our elected assemblies and our elected Senate, as well as most importantly, our governor to make sure that education is fully funded and not with the games of trying to take away star uh, and hurt local tax base. What else are we doing? We're exploring the ability to support summer programming, which was not able to be done last year. Summer cohesion, we're trying to work on, even though we're in a major construction piece, we're also trying to work on ta uh, Varsity H summer camps, additional youth programming for our community and students. It's important that those that are outside the school district must work with the county uh, and get a, an appropriate plan approved as we must have that before we can engage in any type of conversation of scheduling on property. Please understand that this summer is the most intensive summer for construction during this first 
of three full projects. That's the hardest part, but I have a great team. I know Mr. Coglin, his members of his department, as well as all of our buildings will try to do the best so that we can try to get some semblance of normalcy as much as possible. And then one of the things is education has certainly been impacted. Everybody's in the same boat. Students are learning sometimes at a reduced pace, sometimes at uh, independent pace, but we are exploring as a curricular offering a, a potential summer learning opportunity to meet the needs of our students, either in the district or in cooperation with other districts. Obviously, we were, I know BOCES is looking at a potential uh, summer school, maybe for middle school and high school, but we are also looking at something for potentially kindergarten through sixth grade uh, as well. So it's too early. We're trying to get the guidance on what we can do, as well as work out some of the details on what we would need to do to try to make sure everybody has the best foot forward as we return to school. Mostly, we are continuing the, the long range planning for the next phase of our capital improvements under Horsehead's 2030 building our future now initiative. Basically, it would be phase two. It would be the second of three major capital projects, which would now focus on uh, resizing classrooms in the elementary, adding on to some of our elementaries, and ultimately reducing one of our elementary schools, which was part of our long range planning project when I first came into the district. And that is because nothing uh, against any school, one school cannot be improved upon as it's too cost prohibitive, but it is okay for adults to inhibit. And we should eventually phase it out and move students into 21st century learning environments. So more to come on that, but that will be after the budget session uh, because that's going to lead what we can do for the future and try to protect our programs. Now, as I said earlier, we're gonna seek guidance on the governor's parameters for opening 2021-22 school year. But most importantly, we are expecting the governor to fully reopen schools for five days a week in person learning with a minimal restrictions, maybe mask wearing, hopefully uh, three foot distancing and so forth as vaccines become more commonplace. We know there has to be a change as we cannot leave our students in this situation. And I hope as the governor has the executive authority to make anything happen, either that authority is changed and taken back by the legislature and they take care of the kids or the governor does. We need your help to contact everybody and make sure they understand to make it happen. That is what we need for education moving forward. That is what our community needs. And that is an expectation that we all are striving for. Most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, I already said, the light at the end of the tunnel is getting closer. In March, 2020, it looked like a little pinhole. It was so far away, we didn't know what was coming. We didn't know how to get there. We started to learn, we started to adapt. We still didn't know totally in September, 2020, but we knew we were on the tracks and moving forward. Now, as I come to you today with the state of the school, the financial state of the school is okay as long as the federal government comes through and the governor does not play any tricks and try to reduce education by taking the federal money and then subplanning our money in the schools and then later cutting it in other years saying, this year we're fine, but next year we'll just take all the money back and you figure out how to do it. That's not the way this governor is supposed to work and that's not what he's been saying. He said that if he got it, we'd be fully funded. We need you to make sure he delivers. And that leads us to right now, February, 2021, where we're starting to see that bright light at the end of the tunnel. There's still cloudy days ahead. There's variants and so forth. There is waiting for the guidance that we have been told by our district superintendent is forthcoming at any time in the next 24 to 78 hours, which I think is probably like Friday night, but I can't count on it until the governor puts it in. And unfortunately, we have been absolutely responding to Friday night news dumps from the governor all of a sudden saying, we'll be open five days a week. He did that a week and a half ago, but he hasn't provided any guidance and he knows what the problems are. So please, as he's trying to address his issues, please don't let him forget that that light at the end of the tunnel only gets reached by him leading us there and changing the dynamics. I hope you understand, and I hope you will always reach out as you have in the past. And I thank you for listening in the time as our expectation is really to try to do as much as we can within the rules, regulations, and law to get the kids the best education possible. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, questions and answers. This concludes 
my state of the schools address. The school is in very good position to head into the next year, but there are potential bumps ahead and we must continue to plan for horse heads 2030 and we must push the state to reopen our schools. I'm gonna stop sharing right now. This can also be found, uh, I think under the public session, if you wanted to go look at it. Uh, stop yeah, it's sharing. under there. Okay, any questions? Hello, Mr. Doug. Um, thank you, Dr. Douglas, for um, that very comprehensive look at, at where we've been and where we're going. Um, I, for one, would like to move, um, make a motion that you send the letter that you uh, suggested and proposed in your, in your, to the governor in your presentation. I appreciate that, Doug. What happens is, is if we can do that at the end towards the board report, uh, it'll just make it easier. Okay. Any other comments, Brian? Oh, you're on mute, Brian. Sorry about that. Tom, thank you for a great presentation. Um, certainly good to hear that the staff um, the vaccine rate is 60% in that range, and there's potential for more. And I would definitely support what Doug mentioned too. I would be in support of you know sending the letter to the governor and hopefully you know getting permission to go to the three foot distancing with 100% masking. I, I think it is vital to uh, to move as aggressively as we can. So I appreciate you you working on our behalf, and um, whatever we can do to get the vaccine levels up to that'd be tremendous too. So thank you. Any other comments or questions? I, have, I, I have just want to say to Sue, I got done in 30 minutes. <laughs> Good job, Sue. <laughs> um, I have a, I, just a, just a, a quick question. So, cause I'm, I'm sure people listening to this will have the same question as well. Um, but assuming that we do get the thumbs up to move to three feet, you know, I know there's a lot of things that that come into play, you know, having to move furniture back in the classrooms, having to, you know, realign transportation schedules, things like that. You know, how quickly after that would you expect the district to be ready to actually move forward and be able to bring students in four or five days a week? Well, there is a gentleman on this right now. His name is Mike Coglin, and he's probably sitting there sweating. Uh, but if I can, I've had conversations with Mike. We are starting to try to see if we can start pre-staging because all of our equipment could not be stored on district. So we have actually rented space over at the holding point. It, it took about three and a half weeks just to get our stuff over there. Now, I know Mike. He's going to say, I'm going to have nothing that stands in the way of you guys getting open, but it's Herculean. So what happens is we are probably going to start loading and trying to find places where we can put some desks in the classroom, but we would have to mark them off, but we still have to have some discussion with our staff so that they know uh, that's coming. I know I've already informed uh, the high school HTA just so that they knew that, hey, if you start seeing this soon, this is what's happening. It's not that people are coming back, but we would be wrong not to start preparing when we've been told that there could potentially be a major shift. Now we're being told today by another unit in the state that no, the governor's not going to do that. I hate to say it, I just don't know who to believe. All I know is once you say it, and a news article came out of New York City from uh, Assemblywoman Paulson and Assemblywoman Shelley Mayer from Scarsdale and I think Suffolk County. When they start saying that they wanna see it move to three feet, they have said things before in the news media and shortly after they come to fruition because they are two people of very influential power. So there is some validity to this. We've heard from multiple people. I've even heard from uh, individuals that are meeting on regionals that they are having this discussion. We hope it comes sooner rather than later because it would certainly help uh, the tenor, the mental health and the mental wellness of everybody, especially parents uh, that wanna see their kids back in school. But we will try to do a phased approach and you know, we have to we'll look for bringing in other people just for later if we have to, just to try to get it done as swiftly as possible. Okay. 
So I don't know if this is the appropriate time to discuss it, but everybody's um, advocating for going to the three feet. So all the things that I've read say schools can reopen with social distancing. And up until right now, social distancing meant six feet. So what's the research show on six feet versus three feet? Because I'm gonna be asked to vote on something that up until tonight, I had no idea we were gonna have this vote. Yeah. So I'm a little disappointed in that, not being allowed to properly educate myself. So now I'm going to be um, asking, what does the research show mm -hmm. uh, on this issue? Right now, Warren, and, and the action is not to catch you off guard. I apologize for that if you think that. Uh, what, oops. Uh, Okay, I'm getting feedback. Just a second. Um, I apologize for that. That's not the intent. What the issue is, is that it does not require the board to vote on it because you're not committing to it. What you're asking, what I'm asking is, is it okay if I advocate for that at this point to get the governor to move off of his current position and at least give us the guidance? The research on it is that at six feet, there's very little transmissibility between students. Matter of fact, a recent survey that just came out from several schools is that there's more adult to adult spread and more adult to student spread than student to adult or student to student. With masking and six foot um, distancing, it's somewhere between one and 2% of potential issue of spread. When you reduce it down to three feet, there's an additional 10 to 15% that could be there, but that's making sure that you go, that's without proper ventilation is where they were studying it. But we do have all the ventilation in place, the MERV filters, uh, as well as the social distancing going on that if we went down, we have to make sure we consider it. There is some talk also with the three foot that we may have to provide at least desk barriers. I don't know what good they would do, um, but those de desk barriers as a Department of Health uh, exec county executive mentioned at one of our meetings, you have to basically put your head inside, but that's without your mask on. And when you lean back and you're outside of that partition, you have to have your mask on. So I imagine you'd keep it on even if it were at three feet. Now, here's the other argument. We have sports going on with close contact far greater time on a football field, a baseball field, wrestling and, and volleyball and everything else that they may be together one, two, two and a half hours and they're fully masked and we have not been experiencing the spread. I don't know if there's any right or wrong answer, but we need the governor to do something to give us the guidance that uh, we do need from the experts that supposedly he talks to that Shelly Mayer, Amy Paulson and the others are talking to. Any other questions or comments? Warren. So are you asking for permission to advocate for three feet or are you asking permission to advocate for guidance because Guid you know, guidance said and, both. Right. and if the guidance is six feet that well, I, well, we would have to accept that, but yeah. you just want more guidance. Is that what this is going to be about? Or is it going to be, we want three feet? I believe we need to advocate for guidance for a change to the six foot. If he changes it to four, if he changes it to three, I don't know. But I just, I know I could do that advocacy on my own. I try not to put the board in a position because I am the CEO of the district. So what I'm trying to do is advocate for the guidance, change the social distancing requirements if it's medically and important, if it's sound practice, which there is guidance out there that says schools can do it. Um, but I need him and his experts to do that because other than that, we can't do anything except what comes from either the governor, the Department of Health, or state education. I do know in our state education talks, they have said there is strong discussion on this as well. 
Mr. Christmas. Just a, uh, well, one, thank you for the excellent presentation. Uh, and I'm sure you got help from folks on that. So thank you to the others that helped. And I think it, I know it's been a very difficult year for everyone. And uh, I've certainly been very impressed with how everyone has risen to the challenge. Um, I'm, I'm supportive as Doug and Brian are stated they were in terms of seeking the guidance that you discussed. I'm just wondering, it, that's often more um, persuasive when it's when when it's a larger group. Like, are other superintendents, to your knowledge, doing that, or the superintendents? Um, yes. You know, the equivalent of NISBA. You know, is it possible? Are you are you contemplating doing that independently or in conjunction with others that might uh, add some you know weight to the to the guy. There are already school districts in the past week. All of Monroe County has signed the superintendent's letter. I will reach out to my other fellow superintendents as well. Uh, different superintendents across the state down on the island are all starting to advocate for this uh, based on their discussions with health and honestly, also based on the need that children need to get their education and need to get back into school if there's such a low infection rate. And with vaccinations coming out, schools, at least in New York, have a real big advantage. I mean, they're estimating that right now, the 1B population potentially, depending on what county you're in, because some are not doing as well, is up near 60%. I believe I have 33% that we just don't know, but I know some of the people in that 33%, I know they've already gotten it. So we've got to do a final survey on that, and then we will start collecting the data to give to New York. That came out two nights ago, and the reason that came out, they want to know so that they can make some informed judgments based on that vaccine data, I'm sure. Yeah, thank you. And I'm sorry, just I would be remiss if I didn't just mention briefly, in the midst of all of this, as you pointed out, uh, Mike, and his team have done an incredible job with the facilities improvements. I've heard glowing um, remarks about the library and the cafeteria. And um, if I think shoveling my driveway is bad, I can only imagine <laughs> what Mike and his team have had to deal with in terms of the snow we've had. So kudos to, to you and your crew for all their hard work. And um, you know, definitely some some shining, some lights coming through the tunnel, as you said. So thank you. You got some claps there, Mike. <laughs> okay, any other comments? If not, we will move on. So thank you, Dr. Douglas. Um, at this point, uh, Dr. Douglas is gonna go out in the hallway just to um, see who's here for public comment. And in the meantime, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah for our update from our student population. Thank you, Mrs. Dale. So as we move into our second semester, sports have returned and we are wrapping up our winter sports as short as that season was and we're moving on to our fall sports next week. And with that, we are celebrating senior nights and giving our seniors some shout outs on social media and recognizing all their dedication to their team and their effort leading them on and making sure everybody stays positive during this difficult time. And then the start of spring sports will be April 19th. And still, as far as we know, we only have the two spectators and the live streaming for each of the sporting events. For student council with the cafeteria and library opening up, we had a grand opening with balloons, just welcoming the new home for the um, launch monitors and the librarians. And with that, we had a 21st customer opportunity. So the 21st customer in the lunch line would get a gift certificate. And then the 21st um, person to walk in the library and sign in got a gift certificate as well. And March 1st through the 5th next week, we are collecting donations for the Texas Red Cross with what was going on with the snowstorms and the loss of power. Millions of people still don't have water down there and thousands still don't have heat. And what we want to do is together as Raiders, we want to help raise money for them. And March 15th through the 19th, we have a lot going on with student council as well. We're having another spirit week going along with March Madness, a food drive and having it be a competition between each of the classes and some more minute to win it's during the lunch periods. 
with the freshman class, they are starting their fundraiser after spring break, April 13th through the 23rd. They're going to be selling some spring items. So that would include flower seeds, popcorn, kitchen gadgets, and more items. The sophomore class is starting their apparel sale recently, and they're going until March 5th. And they're selling some Reader Strong t-shirts and blankets. And the junior class is still dedicating their time at the food bank on Thursday afternoons with the backpack program. And they keep asking them to come back because they just love our juniors so much, which is really warming our hearts. Um, they have a prom date set tentatively for May 22nd. And they're looking forward to have some sort of celebration depending on what the guidelines and restrictions are at the time. A lot is happening with the senior class. We Last week, we sent an email to the parents with an, with a video in there with our president Neha Kudva speaking about questions and concerns senior parents have been having with what the year is going to be looking like and our response to that is we are working a lot on what's with what we have coming ahead of us and our senior class put together a little newsletter so once a month we'll be sending that out in the emails and on social media we're also starting to plan a safe prom for the weekend of June 18th through the 19th. And we're also preparing for yard signs to be ready for the spring once all the snow and cold is gone. We decided for our day of service to be May 8th. And what we are doing was we're working with the Arnott Hospital and we have an exact, we don't have an exact plan yet on what we are doing, but we had some ideas brewing in our meetings recently and we're having a lot of fun ideas with that and we're going to be meeting with someone at the hospital to discuss what opportunities we can do then. We're also planning a little fun spirit week in the spring as well when things start to warm up and hopefully when people are coming back more. And I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but as a class officer, I've seen the parents' concerns and questions. We are having a lot of ideas brewing in our heads. It's just taking some time, and we want to make this a fun and memorable year, despite all the craziness we've been experiencing, being remote and coming back to school and then going back to remote. We just want to make sure that their parents, students, and the Board of Education know that we are working hard as class officers to provide a fun senior year for the seniors. And with that, I feel like everyone's being happy, being back in school and knock on wood, not going back into um, remote learning 100%. And I am really happy to be back and being able to work with a wonderful school community. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. And just so you know, the board has no doubt that you are working really very hard, you and the rest of the officers to, to have a great year for the seniors. So thank you very much. Um, it's just really nice hearing the activities, hearing the plans for the activities um, so we can end the year on a high note for, for all of our students, but especially for our seniors. So thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to turn it over to our um, community comment section, uh, just to let everybody know the process for this. Um, per board policy, we allocate 30 minutes for community comments. Um, each community member is given three minutes. Uh, we ask that the community member will give their full name and address, um, and then keep their comments or the questions to two, three minutes or less. Um, so I will turn it over. I, I've heard that we have several waiting. Um, so we'll turn it over to the first person. Hi, Chris. Hello. How are you? Good. Dr. Douglas, I'm sure you realize and not surprised that I'm going to be here speaking today for the first person. So um, I just <clears throat> I'm going to start out by saying that I'm basically speaking on behalf of all the kids that are struggling, and I hope that the board and you, Dr. Douglas, realize that there's many, many out there that we probably don't even know about. So um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Kelly Benjamin. Um, I live on Ridge Road, and I am a graduate of Horseheads High School. I'm the proud mother of three boys one who graduated last year and two who are currently enrolled at the Horseheads High School. And they are the third generation of my family to attend. I'm also a member of the Parent Coalition of approximately 350 families 
And one of my main concerns is to get the kids safely back into in-person learning five days a week. Everyone understands that the virtual learning module is a poor substitute for in-person structure and the interaction children receive daily from their teachers. Unfortunately, we are almost at the one year marker of 14 days to slow the spread. And the devastation of this pandemic could not be clearer. So here's a few facts. The Southern tier has the lowest COVID infection rate anywhere in New York state, at least today or yesterday, that could have changed. Science states children are not the super spreaders of COVID. The physical and mental well being of students is at the lowest level of my lifetime and is well documented by professionals all over the United States. <clears throat> Kids need structure, and the excellence associated with the Horsehead School District has been proven over and over for decades. <clears throat> Teachers are vaccinated and most are on their way to receiving the second shot. Testing to assist in monitoring the COVID virus is available, Horseheads is testing. Masks are worn by everybody. Uh, the six feet distancing when possible, except core activity. So that is my question, isn't core activity instruction? So that's just something that I wanted to ask. Um, I would like to touch on leadership for a moment. The federal response to COVID has been dismal. The state response has been to close businesses and schools to control the COVID pandemic. Thousands of businesses will never return and the closing of schools results in unemployment for some of our neighbors. Governor Cuomo stated last Friday, quote, you're not going to reopen the economy without parents having children in school so parents can go on with their life and work, end quote. He also stated, Local districts need to, quote, be aggressive, end quote, in opening the schools to in-person learning. Aggressive, that is a key word from him. The Horseheads High School District has always prided itself with its leadership, and it's been highly ranked in the Southern tier for many years. We have the leadership in this room tonight, so I'm gonna ask a few questions. Why are we not leading by example? Why are we not aggressive in thinking outside the box to institute more in-person learning? At the very least, we should be at three days in, two days remote on a rotating schedule, or we should have plastic barriers in place like many other schools. Why haven't we done another survey? Why can't we marry the politics and leadership into a positive solution for our children? Why is the answer always, we can't? Although the majority of parents are more than willing to help, it is the job of this board of education and this administration to move us forward and prioritize our children's mental, physical, and educational needs. Horsehead's district should be the first to do this, not the last. I have a couple things I wanna mention. Are you aware that parents are moving their children to other states to live with relatives so they can be in five days a week? Are you aware that families moving into the district are putting their kids in private schools? And are you aware that families moving into our district are saying the district is in the stone age? That's embarrassing to me. I love my school. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm really proud to, to be in this district and have my kids go here. So that, that was tough. So finally, I would like to read a quote from Mr. Douglas, Dr. Douglas, dated back to June 2015 when you were preparing to take over as the new superintendent. Quote, Horseheads is a school district that is on the move. It is a progressive district that regularly has been climbing over the past four or five years under the superintendent the board and the instructional staff, equality, education for all, that is what I plan to continue. So it is my wish that the board and Dr. Douglas continue to climb, be progressive in your decisions and keep the Horsehead School District on the move. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, before you, you, you uh, step away, can you just say your street address just so we have it for the record? Oh, 758 Ridge Road. Okay, thank you. Horseheads. Kelly, Kelly, come back. Kelly, I 
I know you probably heard me, but I want to say it for the public. If you can leave your statement, I'll try just because I don't have any, I'm standing up. Sure. I don't have anything. Leave it with Terry and I'll try to add that to those questions and answers as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> Do we have more people? Yes, they have to change and go Okay. Yes, they have to exchange and go in and out. That's the issue. Okay. You're on you're on mute, Katie. Hi, everyone. I you're see good. a lot of my, my friends out there I haven't seen in a long time. Hello. I hope you're all well. I just I just want to just just before I get started, I just want to remind everybody um, that you have three minutes. And yep. if you could please state your name and your address, please. Katie Menard, 30 Hibbard Road, Elmira, New York. I want to start by saying thank you for giving me a chance to talk to everybody today about being a parent here in the Horsehead School District. I am a mother of four. Two of my sons have graduated from the high school and I have two who are currently here. My boys all started their career at Big Flats Elementary. Three have worked their way through the middle schools into the high school and one went through the STEM program, but all carried the same goal of successfully meeting and conquering the required curriculum to graduate. Our educational paths were not perfect. We had some challenges and some failures. However, until January of 2021, we always knew that we had a strong administrative and teacher team providing guidance and support. I've attended numerous meetings with teachers, guidance, special education, and administrators. Each of these encounters consisted of an explanation from the individual teacher or counselor team of what the problem area was, whether it would be organization, speech, homework, and we would work as a team to create a remedy and discuss options and choose the best action plan forward in order to ensure that school and home were on the same page. These meetings and planning sessions to me show how the in-person time spent and knowledge gathered allowed the teachers, guidance counselors, and administrators to connect and impact my boys. It is a true gift a teacher possesses to not only teach students on many different levels, but to see both the extreme nuance to see the both extreme and nuanced issues in individual students that need attention. An even far greater strength is their ability to provide multiple outside of the box antidotes and plans to assist in correcting and smoothing out the issues. As the boys moved up through the, the Horseheads District, these meetings diminished and for some of my boys, they disappeared because they were no longer needed. However, I would always receive communications from their teachers if anything was starting to slip or a bad decision was made. We would address the issues and we would move forward with our ultimate goal of graduation. In January of 2021, I was reviewing the boys' new semester schedules and made the following statement to guidance. I've never seen the boys' grades so low. My thought is, with one boy a freshman and the other a junior, they know how to school. The response I received contradicted everything I've ever heard in my past experiences with the district. I was advised we've lowered our standards. Mm, I disagree, low standards, they're not the answer. Like we need more time in school. Our kids need to connect with our, their teachers, their peers, their coaches, their administrators. My sons always enjoyed their teachers, their counselors, or their principals, seeing them at Target and saying their name. Vinny's guidance counselor doesn't even know what he looks like. Our kids have no connection here, nothing. They're literally sloughing up the stairs on remote days. And sometimes we have long classes. I'll tell you that right now, I'm listening to the classes. I'm working remotely three days a week and English and math and for my boys are knocking it out of the park. Chemistry, I watched 10 minute note sessions and a couple times Louis got to decide if it was gonna be first semester or lab, right? First or second period. 
this is, they're not learning. How can we expect our kids to rise to the occasion to keep horses as the district that people want to move to? If we're not even holding our kids to the standards and, and pushing them to, through, and past their capabilities. We live in an amazing community. We have support from all of our businesses, all of our parents. We have endless creativity. We cannot let our new district motto be, we lowered our standards. I thank you for your time. It was nice to see you all. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Hello. Hi. 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 Um, before you get started, I just want to remind you um, that you have three minutes, so please try to keep your, your comments to three minutes or less. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Jennifer Savino. My address is 321 Sunset Terrace, Elmira, New York. <clears throat> my husband and our three children and I reside in the Horsehead School District, grades 10, 6, and 4. I am also a nurse educator at the Elmire Psychiatric Center. I work with the adult unit and the children's unit. The children are being affected. I can promise you that. <clears throat> Last April, I worked on the COVID unit. I wrote out my will because I did not know what would happen. I understand the fear. I lived it. I'd like to share a text with you from a 12 year old. <clears throat> mom, I love you so much, but do you think I want to fail? I want to do good mom, I really do, but I barely ever get to talk to my friends. I never do stuff outside. I don't have the motivation to do anything anymore. I don't even know if I'm friends with anyone but Noah. Mom, I don't know what to do and everything is just so confusing. I just don't know. That is from my son. He was on the honor roll last year. I believe his average this year is a zero. He is failing every single class. I see schools in New York City have opened up full time. We all know how hard New York City was hit during this pandemic, yet they can't open horse heads. We can't figure it out. We can't be creative. I see a lack of motivation and willingness from our district. Why are we not using barriers now? Even with the six foot distancing, why are we not? We have layers of mitigation, vaccination being the greatest. We as the parents and taxpayers of the district expect you to move forward with extreme aggressiveness in getting our children back to school. And now is the time, trust me. The longer you wait, the worse it will be for our children. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you can just leave your, your comments with Mrs. Clark. Are you taking copies of these? Sure. Thank you. Hi. Um, before you get started, um, I just want to remind you that um, our time limit is three minutes per, per comment. So if you could just please, please keep it to three minutes or under and start off by stating your name and your address, please. It won't be a problem. Uh, my name is Margaret Collins. I live at 2 Chelsea Drive. Uh, so I have two elementary age students and I've actually put them into private school for the year. Um, and I'm here tonight to talk to the board and ask you to consider with the highest priority, a plan to bring our students back to five day in-person instruction. It is my intention to present solutions and progressive steps to be considered so that we can accomplish this. 
First, I'd like to start by clarifying some communications that we've received from the district regarding requirements from the governor's office and the New York Department of Health that are currently preventing our district, district from opening to five-day in-person instruction. I emailed the board a link to the interim guidance document provided by the New York Department of Health earlier this week. Upon reviewing the document, it is clear that social distancing on school grounds is indeed mandated, but does not exclusively mean six foot distancing is required. The document mandates appropriate social distancing and states, quote, appropriate social distancing means six feet of space in all directions between individuals or use of appropriate physical barriers between individuals. Upon reading this, I believe that the district has to date overlooked the latter part of this definition. It is with this clarification that I believe we can find a solution to bring our students back into the classroom five days per week. While I understand the barrier specifications put forth by the New York State Department of Education can be confusing. There have been clarifications issued by the facilities group that share more specifics. I sent those clarifications to Dr. Doug Douglas and the board earlier this week. It seems within reason that Horsehead Central School District may leverage the support of their engineering partners find the products that meet these clarified criteria. It is my assertion that the addition of barriers in our classrooms is the solution to bring our students back into the classroom five days a week. Put an end to waiting on the governor's office. They're not going to update their guidelines out of our control. Given all of that, my question to the board and the administration is, where do we stand on investigating the use of barriers and planning to meet Department of Health guidelines as they are? As a parent, as a citizen of this community, I plead with you, the Department of Education and the administration of Horsehead Central School District, please set a timeline and execute a plan. Get our students back to our buildings five days per week. Address this matter with the utmost urgency. Do not stop trying until it's reality. Reach out to our community partners, collaborate with other districts and make this happen. In March of 2020, our students left their classrooms for, before spring break, never to return to those classrooms. I challenge you, ensure that after spring break 2021, our students can go back to their classrooms five days a week. Thank you. Thank you. Can you see us out there? Yep. Hi, if you can just uh, state your name and your addresses, and then also um, if you could keep, please keep your comments to three minutes or less. Sure. Yep, uh, Chris and Renee Friend, 44 Liberty Way. I uh, just want to start by saying um, I am your state assemblyman, and I know Dr. Douglas well, and I just want to say he's done a great job coming to Albany to advocate on behalf of the Horsehead School District in the time that he served as superintendent. Uh, he, he does a fabulous job going around the floor, lobbying with many of the senators and assembly members, as well as uh, state education department, uh, trying to smooth out the, the problems that we're having. And uh, this year's budget is just like any other. Uh, the state actually has decreased the funding, but thanks to the federal government, we actually have uh, more money uh, coming into our education budget, looking at having about a $31 billion state budget this year. Uh, the go governor, unfortunately, is playing a lot of games with those, uh, with those monies um, by bringing in state dollars and then shuffling them back out through the STAR rebate program back into the state's general fund. Uh, hopefully in our one house budget bills that will be coming up in just a, another couple of weeks, uh, we will hopefully be taking that out. And then when the budget is finalized on April 1st, uh, hopefully we will be successful in removing those uh, changes to the budget and those that funding of, of monies. 
Uh, it's a continual battle, and I appreciate all the support that you can provide us to make those changes. Uh, one of the other big changes that he did is that he's combining all these state reimbursable aid programs uh, into, a, into a single category like he tried to do last year. And again, this is just a disservice to our schools and especially to BOCES. Uh, if, that, if that were to go through, we would look at BOCES competing with your, each of your individual uh, regional schools. And that would, would be a, a big disservice to the BOCES program that provides so many other uh, technological services and uh, degrees for our kids. Um, but those really aren't the reasons that we came in today. Um, my mother was this, uh, on the school board here for 21 years. I'm one of seven. We all graduated from Horseheads High School. I have four kids that are going through uh, Horseheads High School. One graduated, one's a senior this year, unfortunately. Um, and it's just been really demoralizing for a lot of those seniors and a lot of the students who aren't even seniors. It's great that we got sports back. Uh, that's been a big improvement to be able to get the kids together because the cohorts are nice to be able to have that distancing, but the kids don't get to see the other half of their class in any shape or form fashion. And then those kids that are remote never are in there, never have that chance to interact. Uh, so the bringing back the sports, bringing the kids together has been, has been a really good um, thing for the morale, boosting the morale. And that's what we're, we're really here to talk about. We're here to talk about music. And our kids, as well as Ren and I, have been part of the um, <clears throat> marching band program and the music program at Horseheads. Uh, when we went to school and now that our kids went through the program, and we just learned that in order to be part of the marching band program next year, we need a marching band director now. Uh, if they do not participate in the next meeting that happens in March, we would not be able to participate next fall if there is a program in any form or fashion. Um, so that's what we're trying to say is that these, these typically you have to be in, in the program by January, but because of COVID, they're looking at extending that. And I just wanna make everybody aware that this is very important. This is the largest extracurricular activity, a huge morale booster, gives people the opportunity to participate in programs. Maybe they're not a sports person, maybe they're not a science person, but maybe they're into drama, maybe they're into music. And this gives something that when you're in fourth grade to tell them this is a good reason to participate in music. Look at what you get to do when you go to high school and the opportunities to go out there and compete. And you're competing at one time. It's so different from sports because everybody participates at once and is really a unique opportunity. So we just wanted to mention that. Um, but on that same front, um, I, along with my other uh, Southern Tier legislator, Senator O'Mara, Senator Akshar, Assemblyman Palmasano, Assemblywoman Burns, and Assemblyman uh, um, Angelino, uh, we all came together. We're trying to advocate to change the distancing within the performing arts. Currently, the State Education Department has a 12-foot guidance, which again, is not the six foot that we currently have for social distancing, but 12 feet for performing arts. That is not what the National Federation of High School, um, of State High School Association recommends, and not what 125 other educational institutions follow. The University of Colorado and the University of Minnesota have done studies that show that the six foot rule is more than adequate for the performing arts to be safe. Uh, we sent a letter to the governor to the state education department, as well as to the Department of Health, uh, Howard Zucker. And those um, are things that we need for you to help us advocate for, to be able to get our kids back into the music program and to be together, to perform together. And again, to boost that morale, very important to have happen. And I uh, just wanna comment also, uh, the Department of Health or the budget hearing for health happened today and the commissioner was on, and he did talk about changing the guidelines. He did mention the three foot um, possibility with, with barriers, but as um, Superintendent Douglas mentioned, that could come out tonight, it might come out tomorrow. The uh, commissioner mentioned that it was more likely gonna happen next week. Uh, you never know. And that's been probably the biggest problem dealing with uh, the state the state government at, at this point is everything has been last minute and very few people have been involved in that decision-making. And that's why we've been advocating for the legislature to regain its co-equal branch of power and to have that uh, give and take that we're supposed to have. So those changes are gonna be coming um, from the Department of Health, but we don't know when. Uh, that guideline will happen at some point. But again, please give consideration to putting in uh, something for our music program sooner than later, very important because otherwise we're not gonna be part of it next year. And I, I know I went over, I'm a politician. I, I apologize for that. But once I start talking, it's hard to stop. There, so, are, thank there, you. Are, there are two of you. So I gave you six minutes instead of three. <laughs> so, 
yeah. appreciate it. I should have brought my kids in too then, I guess. <laughs> Chris, Thank I you. do have to, I have to ask you a couple questions just because um, a couple things for advocacy. I've been told we can't even get into legislator's office if I go to Albany right now. Correct. Uh, most of the legislative legislators are, are remote at this point. What about Department of Health? Uh, most of the staff in Albany is also remote, so scheduling is, is tricky. Almost everybody's doing things via Zoom. Okay. So the other, the other question that I had is there is some validity to this three-foot change. Yes. Okay. And then the other thing is, is there any funding? Because if they say three foot and barriers, I need at least four to 5,000 barriers, if not more. And right now, the barrier I have, this one is made in Corning. It's 150 a unit. Wow. Yep. Guess and what? I know that the guy right there, Mike Coglin, will be the first one on the street to order them. As soon as I know that they're going to require it, we will start ordering them. But if, at six feet, there's no reason for barriers. But I, I, I am going to probably send you, once I get the draft of the letter, I'm going to have it reviewed by the board. But that letter will, I know you guys are supporting us, but I have to make it sound like all of you need to do something. Um, but the biggest thing is now, if I can advocate right now, now's the time to strike, get with Shelly Mayer, Amy Paulson, they are pushing this. Right. And on top of it, get the power back so that the legislature can make some of these decisions and free us up. Exactly. As far as the music, I am sorry that former employees put out a letter that was ill-advised and wrong. We are in the process of looking for somebody I will make sure somebody's at that field band meeting. The director of the field band is one of my former department chairs and employees. And if I have to, I will call him. If I have to run it, I don't want to, but we will have field band one way or another. And that I know our high school principal has already said, our thing is trying to, like you said on the budget, not cut anything. But the thing I'm most worried about is that he's saying STAR is state aid when STAR is a community's property reduction. It's not state aid. Right. If he does what he does with STAR, the district will lose over four and a half million dollars a year that in a year out, we would have to cut that much from our budget because we will never get it back. So right. thank you for all that you're doing. If you have anything, please tell that group, talk to the high school principal, Tony or myself, we will take care of our kids like we've always done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think there's still at least another person, if not if not a couple out there. So because we're coming up on 30 minutes, I'm just gonna ask right now if we can make a motion to increase it by 15 minutes just to get any last um, comments that we have out there. One more. Okay. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay. Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. All right, sorry about that. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. Um, if you could please just give us your name and your address. And then also um, if you can keep your comments to three minutes or less, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, our, my name is Edison Morera and this is Maria Morera too. And um, we live at uh, 529 Meadowbrook Parkway Horsets. Uh, we are here to advocate for the music program and the marching band. And uh, we have prepared a statement that we would like to read to you. And my wife is gonna proceed to read it to you. Okay. So um, we would like to, uh, first of all, good evening, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity for, you know, being able to talk to you. So I'm gonna read something I just wrote. I didn't know I had to bring a statement, but here it is. So we would like to advocate for the position of assistant music teacher for the high school. The impact of this position in the music program, I cannot em emphasize enough. I cannot express what a life-changing experience music has given to my children. By finding an assistant music teacher for the high school, we consider that the marching band program will have a greater chance of coming back as strong as it was before the pandemic. 
I would like to remind everyone that we ended up winning the state championship on 2019 for the first time in 16 years. We did have a strong program and we can have it again. We already have high risk sports in, in place. There are guidelines for marching. This is a great program that forms character and develops strong fellowship between the students. Also, we are running out of time to fill the position of marching band director, which needs to be reposted. If we want to give the students a chance to compete in the fall of 2021, we need to have a director in order to be able to belong to the New York State Field Band Conference again, and thus be able to compete. We understand that this needs to happen before the end of March. Also, if that position is filled as soon as possible, we could try giving our seniors one last marching experience before they graduate. Um, this is a statement and I would like to add one little thing. So my son is a senior and he is the one who encouraged us. Well, I mean, we were involved in a music program and the marching band, but he encouraged us to you know, advocate for the marching band. Well, he is doing that, we are doing that too. And I just wanna say that this means a lot to him. Um, if, if the fall season happens, that will be wonderful. But also uh, we would like to know if there's a possibility that we can find a director and assistant teacher too, um, you know, as soon as possible. So our seniors can march one last time. I have to say some seniors are already a little discouraged because they think it's not possible. So they're not even too interested anymore, but there's a group of students, seniors and not seniors that would be willing to march one last time, probably, I don't know, May, whenever, uh, just one song. They would just like to play the Star Spangled Banner, something so they can say goodbye to their beloved program. I mean, they didn't have time to say goodbye. Last year they won, it was so wonderful. They were looking forward for this year. And then it got road killed. I mean, it wasn't because of anyone. It was the pandemic, of course. It was the pandemic. No, nothing could happen, not even the sports, but now it's possible. Now the sports are possible, high risk sports. So we, we believe we can make this happen. So there was, this would be a great thing if, you know, we can do something. That's their statement. Well, if I can make a comment real quick. First of all, we have already posted uh, okay. position because we are looking. And like I said um, to the previous couple that was on, we apologize for uh, unprofessional communication that was never supposed to go out. It was a name clearing thing that went out and it was unauthorized. The district will take care of its students like it always has. Uh, as, as I've said, and I know our high school principal has already had some meetings with some groups, we are going to recognize and take care of our seniors. I will make sure somebody in my employee is going to be at the field band championship uh, meetings, as well as the director is one of my former department chairs and former employees. I know him very well, and he will work tirelessly to assist us one way or another. But... Right now, we have to look for a director. As far as the music position, the music position was in the budget because of the pandemic and the reduction of students taking music, it was not required this year. And we had to find, we actually had to buy over 2000 units of technology to, as well as uh, hotspots to help our students. The position hasn't gone away. We're waiting to see what happens for next year. Unfortunately, you can't, you can't have it, your, not your way, but somebody having it their way and then saying that, oh, poor us. The district has always had the intention to increase our music program because we have a drastic need for our students because there are a lot of students that want it. Uh, so you have that support. It's just right now we're in the middle of the pandemic. And I look forward to all the parents helping us make those realities for the kids to get together again in the absence of somebody with our high school principal. Thank you. 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 And that's the last of our community members. Okay. Thank you very much, Terry. Thank you. Okay.
All right. So moving on. So before we move on, I just want to thank all of our community members who did come out tonight. Um, thank you for expressing your your concerns. Um, thank you for your questions and. Um, Whatever questions we were not able to answer right away, uh, Dr. Douglas will post the answers to those questions like he has been doing um, on, our, on our website and communicate that out. So thank you. I hope, I hope any of you feel com comfortable coming in the future. And in the meantime, if you do have a question that you want addressed, um, you can, um, on the Horseheads District website, you can go to the Board of Education and it'll give you um, an email for Nancy Perillo, uh, who will then forward any of your questions or concerns onto the board. So thank you. Yeah, that, that is, if I can say, that is how I can get them a little quicker because they do take time to answer and then get a schedule. Um, I hope people understand we try to do it as quickly as possible, but we're trying to do all the other things everybody's asking about as well. So sometimes there is a delay, but we have answered, I believe, everybody's question up to this point, either by phone call, uh, and Sue keeps me right on task for that. So uh, I want people to know and I want to thank those that came in so that we can try to take care of everything as swiftly as possible. I was very delighted to hear Mr. Friend, Assemblyman Friend, say that what we are saying is out there and now we need to push. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, so moving on uh, to item six, it's our budget presentation uh, for this evening, which will go through technologies, facilities, and our HR presentation. So Katie, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Just give me one second to get it up here. Okay, is my presentation up? Good, thank you. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, tonight, I'm just going to do a uh, quick overview of where we left our overall budget um, from a couple weeks ago, and the directors of uh, human resources, technology, and facilities will present uh, their specific budgets. Um, so we had a good segue into our state aid. Uh, thank you, Assemblyman Friend, for your comments. Um, He's exactly right. Um, there are, you know, frankly, some games happening with our budget this year. Um, we're in a holding pattern at this point, waiting to see what comes from the federal government um, down to the state um, and how the governor is going to handle um, that shuffling of funds um, between federal and state money. So, you know, what we know right now, foundation aid is flat again for the second consecutive year. Um, at this point, I am projecting an increase in transportation aid. Um, but again, holding that to see what happens with our transportation aid in the governor's current proposal uh, regarding the aidability of uh, our services of delivering food and instructional materials. Building A shows a minor decrease. Um, as I mentioned before, a few projects um, ended their 15 years uh, lifespan of aidability. Uh, we are in the process of um, working on the early aid form I had mentioned last time for the high school project. And I'm consulting with our construction team uh, to ensure we can finish the middle school project on time to begin receiving building aid on the middle school project. Um, so once those two pieces come together, uh, that portion of the state aid um, will be updated. Um, so right now, total, uh, excuse me, state aid is just uh, over 34 million. We don't have the Federal CARES Act restoration money or the pandemic adjustment this time because he's changed it to a local district funding adjustment um, offset by the federal COVID-19 supplemental stimulus. This is the adjustment that's proposed to take away from our star reimbursement. Um, and again, creating that hole in our state funding that once this federal money goes away is going to leave the districts um, across the state in a very difficult situation. Um, so waiting to see again where the federal government lands how that affects the state and if Cuomo keeps to his word that if he gets the money, he believes he needs to balance the state budget that these adjustments should go away. Um, so our total adjusted state aid at this point, again, very unknown is 38,242,000, slight decrease from the prior year. 
Um, our property tax cap calculation, um, our current inflation rate is currently 1.23 and tax base growth factor is 1.0053. Both factors are down from the prior year, uh, which does impact our ability to increase our tax levy. So currently our levy um, increases 2.09% uh, or 852,000 dollars. To note, um, if we do incorporate that building aid I mentioned sooner, this capital exemption portion will go down because of that building aid. This section includes our, our capital debt offset by any building aid. Um, the, the high school project um, is anticipated to bring in $3 million, which would bring this figure down. Once it hits negative, the capital exemption figure goes to zero. We're not allowed to carry a negative there. Um, so that would essentially flatten out our levy. Um, to possibly a, a negative change. A summary of our budgeted revenues. Um, currently I'm holding the, the tax levy within this figure flat with the, the prior year. The decrease that you see is the result of the, the decrease uh, at this point projected against our star payment. Um, that is seen by the offset of the federal aid here. Uh, so right now, our total revenues, not accounting for at this point, any use of reserves or fund balance, we're at $78 million. And that right now um, is what we're projecting for the, um, the revenue sources to support our expenditures currently at this point at $84 million. As I mentioned before, there's still a lot of work to do behind the scenes. Um, as far as you know, different adjustments and reductions. Um, so I'm very busy working on those and I will begin presenting those in the upcoming presentations. But at this point, we're at $84.8 million, which is a 3.29% increase from the prior year. So those two pieces at, the, at this time, um, our current gap is 6.8, um, but recall, you know, this doesn't, include any potential tax levy decisions that the board makes, um, you know, where our state aid may land, what federal aid we may be getting, um, use of reserves, fund balance, um, and budget reduction. So a lot of pieces still at our disposal to, to balance the budget that we'll have further discussions on in the future. Um, so before I turn it over to Caitlin, um, any questions the board has at this point on just the overall budget itself or where we stand with the state? Okay. On that side, uh, just our department recap. We heard from the transportation department at the beginning of February. Uh, they had a $658,000 increase to their budget, uh, primarily due to um, the recent settling of a contract to make our bus driver rates uh, more attractive to retain um, our, uh, our, current, our bus driver st status. Uh, so, Caitlin, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Katie. A good evening, board members. Tonight, I can present on the human resources budget for the 21-22 school year. There are some modest increases. You can see at the bottom, it's highlighted that the overall increase is slated to be 3.33%. The top line salaries, that includes salaries for five positions. We have two benefit specialists, two senior clerk typists, and the director position in the human resources department. The budgeted amount for 21-22 is 351-078. Uh, we're budgeting to stand still at 2250 for equipment and supplies. Contractual, uh, that amount for 21-22 budgeted is also the same as this year, 68,587. The contractual line includes the, the major portion at 45, just over 45,000 of that 68,000 number um, goes for Paragon, which is our ACE Affordable Care Act reporting service. They help us gather information for Affordable Care Act, um, complete the reports and make sure we are in compliance with the Affordable Care Act. We do have a self-insured health health plan here at Horsehead, so that's important that we are in compliance with that. 
Um, it also includes some money for if we are in need of any residency challenges and also our EAP, Employees Assistance Program contract. We contract with Clinical Associates of the Southern Tier to offer counseling for all our employees and their dependents. That EAP contract is the other bulk of that amount which it, and that contract is 17,000. The professional fees and contract items at 18,000, that line includes various membership fees for employees around the district, such as Saney's for our building administrators, ASBO and MASLA, which are all um, advocacy training groups and they provide us with um, good, good information. It also includes contractual course reimbursements for teaching assistants and clerical uh, at $4,000. Conference line is $10,140. And that line outlines um, some units have conference numbers, budgeted monies budgeted in their contracts, um, such as confidential staff, OTPTs, also clerical, and also our CSEA group. So that is where the money for those conferences would come from is this line in the HR revenue. Uh, the BOCES line, that includes a variety of services. Many of them are related to health and safety. We do have um, this year, we, it was a new ad um, for 2021 to have a full-time health and safety specialist provided to us by GST BOCES. We work with Tony Steger. He was uh, last year in the district just three days a week. Now we have him five days a week and that's been to our benefit. Um, he, it's working out really well. We'd like to continue it. Um, talking with Tony, he says moving from the three days a week to the five days has been extremely valuable. He's been able to get to all the asbestos inspections uh, that he has to and make sure they are all up to date. Those are very rigorous inspections that have to be done throughout the districts and they need to be completed every six months. Um, it was very challenging to get those um, in compliance last year, he's able to do that much more so now. The also the other big improvement that we're seeing with having uh, our health and safety specialists on staff five days a week is with the construction project. As you know, we have a couple very large projects going on in our district, and Tony is on hand every day to be able to respond to day to day issues. Um, if we need something. It's not call Tony and wait for him to be around. He's there in moments, able to see things live time, um, check, problem solve, see what needs to be done and make sure we do have a safe working environment. That $2,013 in addition to Tony as a, a full-time health and safety specialist in the district also includes uh, other fees related to health and safety, such as training that he does at $15,000. Uh, he does have to, to some testing fees and expenses, fire inspection inspections. And also we have in that line our ASOP, which is our sub co substitute coordination service. We have a service that helps uh, fill absences and BOCES manages that process for us. It, uh, the ASOP COSER cost is $18,000. HR advertising is in there at $4,500. Also cooperative advertising and recruiting through the BOCES, that COSER is $5,000. And also drug and alcohol testing, which BOCES provides for us, uh, for our, all our employees who hold CDC, CDLs, um, that's mostly in the transportation department, that's $10,000. can see again at the bottom, the total increase is slated to be 3.33%. The next slide is just a pullout of that uh, salary line, which is the biggest line of the, the human resources budget. And it does have salaries for all five employees next year at $351,078. Any questions? Okay, thank you, Caitlin. Bill, you're up. Oops. 
of course, director director forgets to unmute themselves. Um, <laughs> good evening, everyone. I'm here to present the technology department budget for the 21-22 school year. Uh, as you can see, most of the line items across the equipment, supplies, technology, contractual services, and summer help have all stayed flat, where we saw a, the larger increase into the BOCI service, which we'll talk a little bit, um, you know, as in the next slide. But equipment uh, covers everything from our laptops, our CPUs, uh, panels, uh, documents, a whole array of instructional equipment. Supplies, everything from cabling to um, bulbs, and excuse me, um, like bulbs for the projectors um, and adapters that are always needed. Uh, we do spend a, quite a bit on cabling and adapters just to keep the equipment connected um, when throughout the year. Um, technology and contractual services tend to you know be like some of the district softwares or contractual things like uh, erratic software to help manage some of our equipment along with like Splashtop, which is a um, software that allows us to um, project to screens as well as um, the, <clears throat> some of the other e, the, like maintenance on server equipment or times where we have to out contract out for people to come in to help us out. Summer help is huge. We do really, um, we do hire some summer help to help us get ready throughout the summer to be ready for the classes coming in in, this, um, in September. Um, it, the summer is really our busy season to really get everything taken care of in time for school to start. And so summer help is always uh, appreciated and we do utilize that uh, from year to year. So as you can see, the largest increase is our BOCES services and what we use with BOCES. And as you can see, the increase is 18.52%. And that includes um, a large sum of money that we put towards the 512 COSER that goes towards equipment um, that we can get aid on. So we can purchase a lot of instructional um, equipment and then get aid on that back to the district. So it is very beneficial for us to do, uh, do so. <clears throat> We've also saw a telecom increase this year. Um, telecom, we had to increase our bandwidth now with as much streaming that we are doing. Um, it was very, it was crucial for us to really increase that to be able to have, well, these types of meetings and also for the students to be able to remotely learn. Uh, we also increased upon that with our network technicians and our instructional support specialist. We increased that to help with not only community support, but also with supporting our teachers and our students here in the district. So BOCES, as you can see the lines here, um, we do uh, rely on BOCES quite a bit as far as technology goes. They do provide an, a lot of wonderful services. Uh, contractual and software services are everything from our Microsoft licensing, uh, the server team, um, telecom teams, the ideals team, which is really why we're able to live stream tonight and as well as live stream our sports, um, as well as helping out with a lot of web applications. Another important thing I would just like to bring up with BOCES and the IDS team, uh, just to kind of throw them some you know, kudos, is they're also help develop our screening program that a lot of the teachers and families in the district uh, have been able to use to help us stay safe and kind of monitor that as we're coming in. Student management system, has everything to do with our school tool, school messenger. These are our important programs to help keep us managed. Financial management is our WinCap and our WinCap web. We have a new voice VoIP system. We're kind of going into our second year with that. Um, and that's a big expenditure, but very valuable to have. And then our instructional equipment, which I kind of mentioned helps us get aid. That instructional equipment we've kind of increased in here because um, just due to this past year of seeing the increase of what we would have to do with our hardware. But we are seeing down the line, we do replacement cycles and replacement cycles for laptops and Promethean panels, which is really the big need right now. Um, we, do, we do have this budget to help get that aid back by going through BOCES. Um, any questions? this point. I do just quickly want to point out that the total on this page does not match the total on the prior page. Uh, 
this slide is just to pull out some of the, the higher dollar coasters we purchased through BOCES. There are um, 30 coasters in total that make up the prior $2.5 million figure. These are just some of the, the higher points within that total. Any questions for Bill? I have a question. Just wondering, I know we had to buy a significant uh, number of devices to enable the remote learning. Um, and I think on the previous slide, the, the money for support or service was, I guess I was calling it equipment. I was calling it, it was, it looked flat. I just was wondering whether, you know, are you anticipating an increase in costs around supporting the additional devices? And if so, do you think the budget will be able to accommodate that? Well, um, at this point where we were looking at that, as far as when you're saying support, as far as like technicians and things of that nature. Yeah, just or, you know, need a new power cord because someone lost like, you know, this sort of um, maintenance and support costs that would go with the devices. No, that's a great question, Dan. And we do, we did increase uh, to a 0.6. Uh, we did have a technician who is here one day a week. We've now increased him. He's here four days a week. So that helped out also with instructional support. Uh, there was an increase as well, the, just as far as the training part of it. Um, mm -hmm. When we were purchasing this fall, we did take a look at that. We bought over a thousand power cords in, in addition to what else we had, 400 additional iPad cords, kind of the, those, like you said, those little odd and ends can really nickel and dime you. So we kind of planned ahead to make sure that we, we put those um, in place. Uh, in doing so, what we did was that amount, as far as the amount staying flat, is that that amount um, by making that purchase in the fall, that kind of put us in a position where our replenishment schedule for this year was kind of made up with the amount that we purchased in the fall. Okay. That's why we were kind of able to keep that flat and increase our um, support for it. Um, so, <coughs> It was it. It was a lot of those things that we had to look at. I'm I kind of appreciate that you you know the, those little things that <laughs> keep me up at night. Yeah, good. That that answers my question. Great. Thank you very much, Bill. Appreciate it. Yeah, if I can also add, Dan, for the rest of the board, um, we are going to have to be very cautious as we go forward because we purchased also a significant amount of equipment in one year, which. I believe we will still have to do one-to-one -one computing for next year. But as we do over the next three to four years, we need to in include some type of strategic funding to start a three or five year replacement of that equipment because otherwise it's all going to come due at once and we spent about $2 million. Any further questions? Thank you. Thank you. Bill. Okay, Mr. Coughlin. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm gonna go over facility services overview for my 2021-2022 budget. Um, salaries is I'm uh, going to break that down on a second page slide when we're going over it a little bit more, but you'll see an increase in there, and I'll explain that as we go a little bit further. Uh, primarily the cleaning staff during the COVID and things that we're very fortunate that you've been able to allow us to get our staffing back to numbers that they were at uh, years earlier with all the high de demands we have. Um, <clears throat> moving on to equipment and vehicles, that's staying flat. You know, that'll break down a you know, our plow vehicles, mowers, all broken down. We do have them on a cycle, been meeting with Jason Johnson, uh, the head mechanic, uh, and most of them now we have on a cycle to go with that. We're keeping that number at a flat number, $297,504. Um, next part of my budget would be the utility side of it. Um, we are very fortunate uh, during even this capital work and going up through, we do purchase these surfaces through a BOCE coaster that uh, you'll see a little bit later down on there. Um, 
you know, I think this is a combination of a couple things on utilities to stay flat. Uh, strong energy program we have, Dan DeLorme, uh, he's retired, but he stayed on to help manage it in a stipend position, the energy, a lot of knowledge there. Uh, worked with another one of my, two of our staff members um, to manage the energy uh, to stay flat with construction as well. Uh, you do drive around. We run a little more energy at night. You see some of the lights, but we feel very fortunate uh, managing that. We're going to stay at the seven hundred thousand dollars. <throat> Contractual service, contracted services. Uh, that's down a little bit. Four fifty-five, seven hundred three this upcoming year. Um, that's uh, going down a little for services that we you know. What's in there would be. Uh, Siemens uh, controls that we have in there, our taxes come out of there, just about anything labor. We do have, uh, you know, a plumbing contract, electrical contract, and a carpentry for things we can't for emergencies, but pretty much contracted services, elevator service, um, they all come out of that area. Um, moving a little of that money over on supplies, the cleaning supplies is an area that you're going to see going up, I'm working with Katie and trying to keep out flat. Uh, some of these services, as our skill sets gone up, we've kept in there, but that was an area we made an adjustment. Next will be our custodial maintenance, uh, cleaning supplies. Uh, yeah, that, that, this is challenging times. Just prior to COVID coming in, uh, we were seeing some increase on certain things, but COVID has driven this number up. Uh, I don't think it's going to go right away. We look at how we clean, what we clean, uh, working with all the electronic devices. Uh, so this will be a number. This is a moving target. You know, Katie and I worked on this. Uh, we feel comfortable at this time. She assures me at any time if we have to revisit. Uh, so we made some adjustments. We will. But this is a number that stayed flat for the last few years. And uh, we must make changes to adjust. So there's an increase there. Uh, the BOCES on there. That's our OCM contract for bidding our uh, utilities and maintaining that account. Um, that. That's their fees that are set. So that increase was there. So you are looking at four million two hundred sixty-seven thousand and fifty-four dollars for an increase of six point six one. Breaking it down a little further on there on the on the facility salary position information. Uh, in my position, facilities director, supervisors, and clerical. You know, I have five myself, Candy, Tim, Greg, and Dan make up the five on there. And the increase in UC there are strictly contractual. Um, earlier, we talked on some with the salaries went up on the custodians. This has moved up to 43 project I'm asking for in the budget for the 2021-22. Uh, been very fortunate. This includes the staff we brought on for COVID and we're adjusting around to the rest of the district. The high school, uh, we have found that to be very beneficial. We've opened up these um, Areas, the libraries, new square footage. We do have an old library. Um, you know, one person's being, one extra person's in each of our buildings right now during the day to keep us um, disinfected and cleaned. Uh, they'll be adjusted most of the buildings, the high school and middle school at those sides, working currently with Caitlin with some of our <laughs> hires and adjusting those hours. So the increase you're seeing primarily in the budget was strictly on staffing and the custodian and cleaning department. So that number's gone up. Um, on the maintenance, you know, still keeping the staff at 12, that'll be, you know, grounds, electrical, plumbing, carpentry. Uh, those 12, that number stays flat. And the increase you're seeing there is strictly in the contractual side. Uh, next item on there is overtime substitutes and summer help. Um, you know, th that number uh, we adjusted down a little bit to keeping the budget flat on that particular one. Uh, and that was just based off looking to see what we've spent the last couple of years and some trending on there. Um, so that there's a reduction on that side. Uh, stipends, uh, that's increased, that's contractual. Part of that would be Mr. DeLorme coming, our energy, uh, licenses, uh, some CDLs, other stipends that we have on there. It's actually our on-call stipend. You know, we have 24 seven, someone has to pick up that phone. Uh, so there's a stipend that's been out there for a while that falls in there as well, as we're called. Uh, so for a grand total of uh, 2,496,447,000.
And that's my presentation on facility service budget. At this time, I'll take any questions. All right. I Thanks, think Mike. I'm done. It's all you. No questions. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so that concludes the presentation tonight. Um, next meeting um, will be next week, Thursday, March 4th. Um, I got a little ahead of myself the last time I said athletics and special education would present tonight. They're actually presenting next week. Uh, so next week we'll hear from them. Um, I will ask you know, everybody at this point, I know the budget gap does seem rather daunting at this time, um, but we simply just ask for your patience as we work through it. Um, things may change rapidly, you know, at the federal and the state levels, um, which may change things very quickly. So bear with us as we gather more information and see what it means for our budget as we continue into future presentations. Yes, it's two weeks out, Katie, just. March 4th? March 4th is next week. It is next week? It sure yes. is. Ah, oh. okay. Sorry, Katie, guess what? I didn't know we had another one next week. Lucky for you, I did. <laughs> um, it's sort of one thing after another. We have to be very mindful. I did have a chance to step out and talk to Chris Friend uh, as our assemblyman. He is at least letting me know that, you know, we keep our fingers crossed, but right now the way that the aid the governor has proposed does not look like it is going to follow through. Uh, a myriad of factors. The, the Democrats are absolutely in super majorities in both houses and they can actually start to dictate because of the personal issues and professional issues going on with the governor right now, they are much more inclined to assert their will uh, is what we're hearing. So I will be reaching out. I may have to go to Albany uh, soon just to have some discussions with uh, different superintendent organizations because we are finding out that because of the way that the tax cap calculations are working out this year, a lot of people may be in negative uh, numbers uh, just to get a majority and they cannot fund their budgets going forward. So it's something we are going to have to be very careful about. The best part about our budget is even if we're uh, negative or if we ever considered challenging, at least it looks like in a very low amount under the 2% uh, amount that people would be used to, which is much lower than we've done for the past three years, uh, it would still potentially be close to a 0% tax rate or a negative rate is estimate at this time, but we will give you more information on that as we finalize the budget. Katie has done a very good conservative job of estimating just like last year. I think we were estimating that it would be like $6 per hundred thousand ended up being a reduction of four dollars per hundred thousand which uh came as a surprise to us but that means our district is growing even during the pandemic we know our district has grown just not as fast as the previous year so those are all good things and people should know even with the budget and our current project which is has a capital uh, cost of 94 million we have not raised taxes on the tax on true rate during my six years here, even with that project, which was supposed to raise taxes. So those are all good financial things. Let's keep it going. And then uh, that's the growth that helps bring up property values and raise the wealth of the district so that it can drive taxes down, which has been our experience. So we wanna thank everybody and hope that uh, gives you a good overview until we get to the end, the end of April. Okay. Thank you. So moving on to board report, um, I don't have anything specific um, for our president's report. So I'll turn it over to the audit committee for their report this month. Sure, the audit committee met um, February 8th. We had a visit from Julie Kephart, who is our internal auditor. She had reviewed a bunch of things over the last couple months, uh, building access badges, inventory and assets, the Medicaid session notes, bus driver training. I-9 forms, leave accruals, and required board training. She had reviewed all those items. A couple of minor things when, were noted. Um, we also went over the next three years, kind of the, the key things to review per the audit team. And then Katie spent the last few minutes uh, kind of talking about the corrective action plan. 
and everything either has been completed or will be completed by the end of the school year. Um, the full full reports in the finance committee tonight, along with the corrective action plan. Okay, thank you, Brian. Policy committee report. Yes, uh, we met on February 11th. Um, we reviewed policies on our school board legislative <clears throat> program, board staff communications, uh, use of electronic email for the board, promotion and retention of students and gender neutral bathroom policy. Um, we are recommending changes uh, to the first two, policy 2600, policy 2700. Um, and for the first time in a long time, we uh, said that no changes would be need necessary for policies 2710 on email and 4750 promotion and retention of students. And we are bringing forward a brand new policy draft on gender neutral bathroom policy pursuant to state law. Okay, thank you. Um, and I failed to ask if there was any if there was any questions or comments for the audit committee report. So I'll open it up to questions or comments to either of the reports. Okay, moving on to our finance items for action. So before us, we have 8.02 through 8.21. So can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay, any questions or comments on any of the items under finance? Doug? Um, as a BOSIS employee, I am going to abstain on item 8.07 because the BOSIS expenditures within that document. Okay, anything else? Okay, all those in favor of 8.02 through 8.21 say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. And abstentions, we have uh, Doug for 8.07. Okay. Thank you. So moving on to our personnel items up for action. We have 9.02 through 9.04. Can I have a motion? So moved. Excuse me. Any questions or comments? <coughs> Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. And any abstentions? Okay. Our miscellaneous items for action, we have 10.02 through 10.05. So can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. And any abstentions? Okay, so moving on to our board policies, we have four up for a second reading, 11.01 uh, through 11.04. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay, any questions or comments on any of these? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. And any abstentions? Okay, so we have five board policies for first reading, 12.01 uh, through 12.05. Um, any comments or questions you have for the policy committee? Okay, well, we will be reviewing these for action then at our next meeting. So next are our board member comments. So I'll open it up for any comments that any of our board members might have at this time. Brian. Yeah, I would just like to uh, thank our student representative, Sarah. She, you know, not only has amazing reports and updates, but always so positive, optimistic, and thank you to you and the rest of the students for trying to make this year as 
possibly as close to normal as possible, but your reports are amazing. I look forward to hearing them every every month. And you guys are really trying to make the best of it. And I, um, you know, I'm just in awe of what you're trying to pull off. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. I couldn't have said that any better than Brian did. So I echo that. And then I just wanted to state um, that I was, you know, I know we're dealing with difficult subjects and, and emotional subjects and but I was really glad to see the members of the community come and speak tonight. I, I appreciate the work that was done to facilitate the Zoom, the ability for them to speak via Zoom. I think it's meaningful for us as a board to be able to see and hear the folks directly. And I know that they took time out of their schedules to come and speak to us. And I'm deeply appreciative of that. Uh, you know, and I and I welcome, I just wanted to say thank you to the, to the public for coming and, and letting us hear from them. And, um, you know, that's all, thanks. Thanks, Dan. Marianne? Um, I feel the same way about Sarah. You are such an articulate young lady. It absolutely amazes me. And it must be really difficult when you think of what could have been and can't be, and you keep moving on forward. And I think your initiative to have the fundraising event um, for the Red Cross is really very, very nice. I thank you for that. I agree. I gl I'm glad that we had a lot of community members coming today and feeling comfortable and sharing their opinions with us. And I just have to say there was one comment that was made by one of the community members today that just isn't setting well with me. And that was the one where I, I don't remember who it was, I guess it doesn't matter, but who said that a response had been given to her that we are low, we have lowered our standards. I don't see that happening in the Horsehead School District. Everyone in this school district goes above and beyond every single day to make it the very best they possibly can. And um, I just didn't think that was a fair statement. It's just an opinion. Thank you. Just so that you know, Mrs. Holler, and I mean, Mrs. Corbett, <laughs> um, I, I will be reaching out just because that sort of bothered me as well. Because yeah. I'm me and I've not heard that from a building principal. So I will try to find a little more context to it so we can try to assist like we would do for anybody. I just would hate to see that kind of a statement uh, without backing up or whatever, going out into the community because it's just so far from real. And, and I know they can't make the statement here because it would be talking about personnel, mm -hmm. but because they did make the statement, we will at least try to give due diligence to it. Thank you. Any other comments? Doug? Um, so I, I have a fair number of comments tonight, tonight and I just wanna take a little time to share them and some of the research I've done. Um, <clears throat> for those of you watching at home that don't know me, my name is Doug Johnson and I wanna speak about allowing students to attend school in person five days a week. But before that is, I get into that issue in detail, I need to give you a little background and context. So I'm an attorney with over 26 years working in education, including 18 years with the Greater Southern Tier BOCES. And one role I have at BOCES is as the COVID-19 safety coordinator. There's a lot of confusion around what is actually legally required in reopening schools. So for context, School districts have to comply with federal regula the federal constitution, statutes and regulations, along with the state constitution, statutes and regulations. Under the current disaster emergency, the legislature has granted emergency powers by which the governor can alter or create laws through written executive orders. Those are things that are considered law now. Through executive order, the governor closed schools beginning March 17, 2020 until the end of the 1920 school year. Last summer, the New York State Department of Health and State Education Department issued guidance documents to guide districts in developing plans to reopen the schools for the current school year. Are these documents law is a reasonable question to ask. And there's a pretty clear answer on the State Education Department document. It's not law. The Board of Regents could have made it a regulation and therefore made it law and binding on school districts, but they didn't do that for whatever reason. But it's also clear that the Department of Health document for the state is law. The governor issued an executive order on September 4th that stated, 
The directive contained in Executive Order 202.45, requiring closure of all schools statewide to in-person instruction is hereby modified only so far as to authorize schools statewide to be open for instruction effective September 1, 2020, subject to adherence to Department of Health issued guidance and directives. That's Executive Order 202.6, if you want to look it up online. So um, what is required under this? So uh, the big sticking point, it appears, with reopening schools five days a week is the so-called six-foot rule. From page 10 of the Department of Health Master Guidance, it says, responsible parties must ensure that appropriate social distancing is maintained between individuals while in school facilities and on school grounds, inclusive of students, faculty, and staff, unless safety or the core activity, for example, instruction, moving equipment, using an elevator, traveling in common areas requires a shorter distance or individuals are of the same household. So, well, let's talk, we'll talk more about the core activity um, piece in a second. It also says on page 10, responsible parties are strongly encouraged to restrict the use of classrooms and other places where students, faculty, and staff gather. For example, lockers, cubbies, entryways, hallways, so that individuals can be socially distanced, for example, side to side and when facing one another, and are not sharing workstations, desks, tables, or other shared services without cleaning and disinfection between use. In the law, it's extremely important which uh, verb is being used. A must, a will, and a shall means something is required. Encouraged or should means it's not required. Here, responsible parties are strongly encouraged to socially distance classrooms, but it does not require it. Also, the unless safety or core activity exception is a huge exception because it includes within that exception instruction. So you can um, have instruction occur within six feet um, as long as you're doing your best to maintain social distancing. But if you can't due to the number of students and the size of your facility, my reading of, the, of these guidance documents that are considered law is that that would be allowable. And last Friday, um, Governor Cuomo said, and I quote, so open the schools and the local government should be aggressive on in-class teaching unless there's a community or school that has an infection spike. But if the school doesn't have an infection spike and if the school is safer than the surrounding community, which is what our Department of Health is saying, then why isn't the, the school open five days a week? Governor Cuomo is well aware of the so-called six foot rule in state guidance documents. He, over the summer, he continually talked about how our school is gonna open with six feet social distancing. Yet he made no mention at all of having to change the six foot rule, so-called, to make this happen. My question to the administration, to the board is, are we being aggressive to get students back in school five days a week? If the governor is strongly encouraging us to do that, who would, who would tell the district that it's violating the law? Complain to the State Department of Health when the governor is telling us to be aggressive and opening up our schools five days a week. Now, there, so that provides us the opening to do it. But on substantive part of why schools should be open five days a week, when we met on July 31st, I presented the following arguments as to why our schools should be open as much as possible. We have concerns, of course, in our community, as every community, of the economically disadvantaged versus the economically advantaged, what's commonly called the digital divide. Poor families are not able to afford the equipment and afford the internet access that others can. Now, I applaud the school district for its efforts in providing those where they can, but not every family is going to ask for that help and it would be much more advantageous to have them actually in school rather than um, asking for equipment or being on a remote basis in the first place. Um, I applaud the district for allowing special education students to attend five days a week. But of course that begs the question, how are they able to um, be able to attend five days a week? Yes, some special education classrooms have smaller um, ratios but what about larger ones, um, how, like 15 one classrooms? How are they being run? 
Um, BOCES is open five days a week. Again, BOCES is able to comply with the Department of Health guidelines and be open five days a week um, to school districts. I brought up the, the painful situation with high school seniors having to go through the school year with almost no activities or gatherings. And I also salute um, Sarah and everything that um, the senior leadership is doing to try and make it as normal a year as possible. Those social interactions I also brought up were are going to would be devastating to children. And that is, I think, the biggest issue facing us right now. The mental health in our community, especially among our students, and from every parent that I talk to, especially the intermediate and middle schools, children are suffering. If you want to get mental health services for your child in this community right now, it, you're, you're in a long waiting line right now. There, uh, if your child is potentially suicidal, you can get moved up to the front of the line. But if you don't have that aspect, and I pray to God that virtually no parents are dealing with that, then you are not able to get immediate mental health services in this area. Um, I, I won't belabor the point, but mental health is a humongous issue that I'd say let's take a chance, let's be aggressive and reopen five days a week rather than hurting our children any longer. Lastly, a point that I made in July is that online instruction was ineffective in some subpar, so why did we start out with a plan that's dependent on what didn't work last year? I think there's been some modest improvements in the online in terms of delivery, si si uh, delivery system, but it's still inadequate. And that's not due to the teachers or what, anything that they're doing or necessarily the technology. It's just inadequate. And I think everyone agrees on that in comparison to in-person in teaching. So I would strongly encourage our school board to take a stand to reopen schools five days a week by deeming classroom instruction a co core activity that may, when necessary, be provided within six feet of others in the classroom. Thank you. So um, if I may make a few comments. Um, so thank you, Doug, for, for your comments. And, you know, um, obviously you've put a lot of thought into that statement and did a lot of preparation work. So I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just flying from the seat of my pants right now and some of the uh, reactions and, and comments. So, um, one, you know, I guess, I guess my question is, and, and if, if six feet's not a requirement and six feet's not important, then why is it in all the guidelines and all the documentation and everything that we've seen coming from the state and the department of health and the CDC? So, you know, I, I think that our district has followed all the guidance and best practices that it's been given um, in order to make our school environment as safe as possible for our for our students and our staff. And you know, it's there's no doubt. I I know that this has taken a huge toll on our students and their families and on our staff and on the entire community. Um, you know, thousands of people have been negatively impacted by this entire pandemic, and I know it's not easy. Um, but I also feel very strongly that, you know, we as a district need to continue to comply to the guidelines and the requirements that are coming from the state. And, and my interpretation of that is, is differently than yours. Um, and, and that's fine. You know, um, I think we can agree to disagree. Um, but I just, you know, I, I think um, I applaud our district for everything our district has done to try to get the students as much as possible into the classroom. And, you know, and there are still schools, you know, in New York state and, and across the US that are still 100% remote. Um, you know, so I think at least we have some, some semblance of instruction. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful for us to be able to get our students back as quickly as possible. Um, as, as we heard earlier, you know, there's a lot of um, hope that we're gonna move from the six feet to, to uh, three feet. But until that, until, until we hear, until I hear that it's no longer a requirement or it's no longer part of the guidance, um, I, I'm still gonna stand by 
the six feet of social distancing. Um, and then the other, the other last thing, sorry, I, I was kind of making some notes, um, as far as, you know, the technology and the equipment, you know, we've, I, I think we've done as much communication as we possibly can to families about if you don't have the equipment or you don't have the connection, you know, please let us know so, so the district can help with that. Um, so I do think that, that the district has done absolutely everything possible. And if there are still our families out there that are struggling with the technology and struggling with, with connections, um, they need to come forward to be able to, you know, bring that to the attention of the district so it can be, so, so it can be rectified. That's, that's all I have. Any other comments? Reactions? Hey, Christine, I'll say a couple of things um, real quick. First of all, I'll echo your sentiments. Thank you very much, Doug, for that. That was very well thought out. And, you know, I think my opinion on this has been pretty clear over the course of time that, that I think we have to continue to do everything in our power to get kids back in school. Um, I, I can tell you that I see it every day. I have people who work for me across the state you know, amazing working mom and moms and dads who have kids right behind them, taking up Wi-Fi, trying to learn as best they can. It's just not happening. We have wonderful teachers. We have we have some of the best teachers in the state right here in our school district. And I don't care how good you are. For many students, learning is just not taking place. And I want to thank the community members for coming out and talking in front of this group and talking in front of the community. That is not an easy thing to do. Um, I, I think we just need to continue to do everything in our power to get people back live. It's up to the experts on the, on the health and safety side to determine whether or not the risk is higher than the reward from that perspective. But we need to continue to work to get everybody back, back in school for their sake because learning transfer is just, it's just not happening. And I don't know how anybody can expect it to happen effectively, to be fair. And I'll end by saying this, um, it's been a long time since I embarrassed Sarah Yorio. I used to do it all the time. So I'll, I'll, I'll take the opportunity to do it one more time and say, you know, what an amazing, amazing person that kid is, um, amazing young lady. And, and thank you for all you're doing. Um, you've long been one of my favorites for a long period of time. So thank you very much, Sarah, for everything you're doing. And tell mom and dad I said hi. Any other comments? I just have one if nobody else is going to. So I just wanted to hold off from Doug's earlier thing in the earlier part of the meeting about advocacy and stuff that we just wanted to chat during this time. So you have my full support to advocate on behalf of the district. And, and what I wanted to say, uh, because I, I never try to send something out that's going to be sort of, how would you say, insightful that could cause the governor's wrath upon me uh, or the district. I will share whatever I have with the board prior to it, like I always do, uh, just to get one is, you know, Sue's going to help me, Tony's going to help me, but the board also assists me when we do this writing process. If you have anything, look for that over the next day or over the weekend, because I'd like to be able to take it to Albany if I have to and hand deliver it as well. Ajib. Um, I think, uh, Tom, I, uh, I know a couple of months ago, back in Lancet, it's a British medical journal, there was a World Health Organization funded study that was published. And it was, uh, it was a study looking at, I think it was like 176 studies. They were doing a, like a meta-analysis from 16 different countries. Uh, and uh, they were kind of suggesting that, you know, that the three meter, like one meter, three feet distance with mask probably was, uh, was good enough. Although of course, you know, six will, will be better, but I thought they, at least that, uh, you know, uh, you know, could support us 
uh, that uh, there is at least this was not you know WHO uh, study, but at least it was funded by them. It was published in a you know very reputable medical journal. So I'll see if I can uh, you know get access to that. That may be something to support. Uh, the only thing is that uh, at least that we practice, and also I think that article I remember was that um, uh, eye protection. So I think since we were talking about having those uh, barriers, uh, if we you know that would be more you know very expensive you know deal. Uh, if we can consider having at least goggles, then that might as well, uh, you know, I don't think that that would be that expensive, you know, if it's going to be five, six bucks per, per piece, probably, you know, um, so that might be an additional thing. So masking and goggles and then three feet, I think that probably we might make a case, but I'll, I'll get you that uh, document to see if that would help. No, I appreciate that. You also bring up as a tech teacher and an industrial arts teacher or a shop teacher for those people my age, uh, what happens is now the goggle wear, we do have some kids wearing just clear um, safety protection. Like, you know, you see that they're more, they're not the goggles. Um, I'd hate to see kids running around with goggles on, but as a tech teacher, I kind of like that. But we, I, you can also look at barriers being around the face, the eye as the head, head, head shield as well. Uh, we've seen some of that. So there are all kinds of options. It's interesting because when I, I did talk to an assemblyman friend, he said they were um, talking about that three foot. They have not said that there's barriers because they were, they were quoting some type of study that said, it would be preferable that you had your mask and so forth. So we do have to wait for a little guidance, but any information that I can add uh, to it and also provide so the board can read, that's fine too. So thank you. Okay, um, just a- Word in general, thumbs up for me, starting to produce something so we can try to use it. Yep, looks like it. Warren. Again, I'm not sure what I'm saying yes to. Am I saying yes to three feet or saying yes to advocate for what's best for the district? If a little, the answer a little is what's both, best for the district, to three feet. Me? A little of both, but it's not tied to three feet. Because I'm going to try to craft it that you have to change change your guidance from the six feet in order to make it more palatable. That's that space can be used to bring kids back in person. It will be a craft of wording. I really just wish to have more time to think about it, but. Well, let me write, let me write something and that way you can sort of weigh into me and I'll have a, uh, please forgive me, I'll have a little private chat to try to make sure I assuage your concerns as well. I think I understand them. I think I will hear from uh, certain bargaining units tomorrow to try to make sure that I'm trying to shape it, but I'm also trying to work with those units because they're, I will tell you, a lot of them are working on the same thing. It's just maybe different verbiage. So it seems from looking at at least I have, a, a, um, I'm not gonna say general consensus, but support from the board to at least move forward and uh, then we can weigh in there and you can just call me and talk and see how I can sort yes. of adjust things. Yes. Thank you. Um, just a few comments that I wanna make um, as well is, you know, I, I say this at every board meeting, I'll continue to say it. Um, I just wanna thank everybody, you know, the students, the parents, the staff, the administration, the community members, just for ongoing patience, um, ongoing support, ongoing understanding, you know, um, this has been a difficult time for everybody. And I think, you know, there's not one person that does not want what's best for our children. Um, and it's just trying to balance everything and all everything that needs to be considered um and so just you know thank you uh for everybody who just has worked tirelessly um to just try to find solutions and and try to figure out how we can um do the best for our children and and again you know i it's i know it's it's definitely not easy for the students or for their families so um thank you um 
I also, you know, it's, it's been, you know, also exciting because we have been able to bring some things back. Um, so with bringing back the athletics and, and having um, that school spirit associated with the um, getting the uh, students together on their athletic teams, um, being able to now start having some spectators at the events. Um, I think that's kind of lightening the air a little bit and people are starting to feel a little bit better um, having some interactions, but I would like to really thank the district and, and everybody who has contributed to the ability for the live streaming. Um, I know, you know, that's been really nice to be able to watch sporting events that normally I wouldn't be able to actually get to live um, in, in a regular non-COVID environment. So, you know, be able to to watch things online. You know, I hope, I hope when all of this ends and we can have packed gymnasiums um, and packed stadiums, I, I hope that we'll continue the live streams. So, you know, out of town family members can still watch, watch our athletes compete and participate in, in their different activities. So thank you for everybody who has contributed to that. Um, I want to con congratulate our seniors. I know we've been recognizing, uh, Sue's been doing a wonderful job recognizing our seniors every single day out on social media sites. Um, that's just been wonderful. You know, uh, that's, you know, it's, it's great to see that. It's great to, to, to see the names, see what their interests are, see what they want to do in 20 years from now. So it's, it's pretty neat. Um, we have a lot of people that are going to be successful in 20 years. So it's, it, it's, uh, I'm, ha I'm happy to see that. Um, but then also to congratulate our senior athletes that are starting to get their recognition at their sporting events as well. Um, so congratulations to all of them. Um, and then I also want to say, um, I was going to say good luck to the, uh, the green room players, but I guess I should say break a leg um, for your performance of Clue on Saturday. Uh, that looks like it's going to be absolutely amazing. Um, so I'm glad, I'm glad to see that we're going to start getting some, some performances by our, by our music department. So um, break a leg to everybody participating and thank you to everybody who's put in some work to that. So, um, so I will, I will stop with my thank yous now and, uh, I'll, if anybody else has anything else to add, if not, we will move on. Okay, so we are towards the, we're at the end of our agenda. Um, we are, there was one more topic that we were in the middle of discussing, um, discussing an executive session before we broke to come over to public session. So I would like to adjourn back to executive session. Um, if I can have a motion for that. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed nay. And any abstentions. So we will go back to the executive session zoom link, please. Um, and then Tom will wrap this up. Yes, thank you, President Dale. Uh, we will go into executive session and it's important to note for the community, there will be no further action of the Board of Education tonight. It's just for a discussion on a legal uh, matter. Uh, so at this time, this does conclude the February 25th Board of Education meeting for the Horsehead Central School District. We appreciate everyone who has come out, listened or watched online. Uh, we appreciate your support as well as your dedication and candor. Please keep it always positive and we will always work for the best of our students and our community. At this time, this will conclude the board meeting as we will exit from executive session only to adjourn. Thank you very much for watching.